Classical maximum. Flying in last second. Hey Optima, I feel like Superman today. Wow, you must have fallen in love? Not really. I mean yes, but it's not what you are thinking. What is it Max? It's love for my new major if you will. I just saw this US news article on job outlook for recent college graduates. Dr. Ferris forwarded it to everyone. Look, isn't it beautiful? It surely is handsome, especially that third job on the list. That's what I'm talking about. I'm glad I changed my major from applied math to industrial engineering last year. Of course, it makes sense if you like operations research. Many of our fellow OR graduate students majored in applied math as undergraduates. True, I am not the only one this smart. You are still one of a kind. That's why you were chosen to help with ISIN 320. Right, let's not mention that nobody else wanted to do it other than you. It's just too much work for most normal people. Hard work always pays off, especially when it is also so much fun. I want to hear more about the fun part. Haven't you had fun with all the LP models we learned so far? Sure. I found the Beefwiser example from the quiz especially amusing. My grandfather was a butcher. The most satisfying part is seeing the solver returning an optimal solution after you spend an hour on debugging the code. Don't be so dramatic Max, you spent no more than 10 minutes on it. Okay, let's not be so pedantic. Anyway, my favorite model was the nurse scheduling example. The dancing nurses at the end of the video were icing on the cake. The dancing part was kinda corny to my taste, but I did like the example. The optimal solution was a nurse's and a manager's dream. How did you like the homework problems? Not bad, but it took me a while to figure out the trick with the additional variable, in the second feed go problem. That's not a trick, that's a method. What's the difference? You don't know? A method is a trick applied more than once. Ha ha. But I have only seen it applied once, in that Fedco problem. Let's look at another example. Suppose we slightly change one of the assumptions in the heavenly pouch example. I see. Previously we assumed that we cannot sell more than 350 non-reversible carriers, but now the management shows some flexibility and considers selling more than 350 units for a discounted price. Precisely. The first 350 non-reversible carriers will be sold for $23, and any extra carriers, for $20 apiece. Marvelous. I would buy one for my sister with a discount. There you go. That's exactly why this assumption makes more sense than just setting an upper bound on the demand. Discounts generate additional demand. I concur with this assessment. Great. Here is our old model. Let's see what we need to change about it to reflect the new condition. I think we just need to introduce another variable to describe the number of non-reversible carriers sold with the discount. And what do we do with the old x1 variable? The good old x1 will represent the number of carriers sold for the regular price now. Excellent. Let's update the model accordingly. Easy peasy. We call the new variable x1 prime, and add it to the objective with the coefficient of 12, which is 20 minus 8. That's right. You need to remember to subtract the cost of manufacturing from the revenue to obtain profit, which is what we are maximizing in this example. Also, we include x1 prime with the same coefficient as x1 in all the constraints except for the demand constraint, which now says that we cannot sell more than 350 non-reversible carriers for the regular price. Precisely, in all the other constraints the coefficients for x1 and x1 prime are the same because these variables represent the same product manufactured using the same processes and resources. Right, only the price differs. And the maximization objective ensures that x1 prime is zero unless x1 equals 350. Certainly. Why would they sell a sling for $20 when they can sell it for 23? But wait, what if we were minimizing instead of maximizing? Then the method would not work because the model would allow selling with discount before satisfying the demand for the regularly priced items. Is there another method we could use in case of minimization? Yes, but it requires introducing binary variables, so the model is not a linear program anymore and is more difficult to solve. 
Another reason why maximum is better than minimum. Well maximum, I get the pun, but technically this method works well for maximization because the profit function looks like in this figure. It is a piecewise linear function, where the slope is 15 for the first linear piece and 12 for the second piece. So, the slope is decreasing. That's right. When the slope is decreasing, the piecewise linear function is concave and can be used in a maximization LP framework. What if the slope was increasing? Then our objective function would be convex and the LP formulation would not work for maximization. Instead it could be used in an LP with a minimization objective. Can we consider an example? Sure. Can you think of some real-life cost minimization scenario where costs are increasing with the volume of production? Yes, my dad owns a small company manufacturing these amazing trampolines. The company is called Max Jump LLC, and I was the very first customer when I was four. Cool, you have a company named after you. It's just a small LLC, not a city or anything, not a big deal. Anyhow, my dad was telling me he is trying to figure out a way of cutting the production and inventory costs. Whenever the demand is high, he ends up paying more for overtime labor. Sounds just like what we need for our example. Has he given you the numbers we can work with? I'm aware of some of the data and we can make up the rest. Sounds good. Once we develop an ample model, you can change the numbers to correct once later on. Deal? So, suppose we are planning for the next quarter, the demand for the next four months is 110, 120, 130 and 100. Also, assume that the initial inventory is 20 trampolines. I know that they can manufacture up to 100 trampolines per month, and each unit costs around $120 to make using regular time labor. With overtime labor it goes up to $150 per trampoline. Here comes our increasing slope in the cost function. It goes up from $120 to $150. A perfect example max. Thank you dear. Finally, each trampoline not sold by the end of the month costs $10 to store in the warehouse. The warehouse can fit up to 25 units. And of course, our objective is to minimize the total production and inventory cost. While satisfying the demand I must add. Certainly. Let's think how to formulate this problem as a linear program. Let's do it. Since we want to eventually implement it in Ample I want to start by introducing the set T of indices representing each of the four months. Makes perfect sense. Since we need to decide how many trampolines to produce each month, we should define our decision variables accordingly. But we need to remember to separate the units produced using regular time labor from those utilizing the overtime labor. Right, that's why we introduce two types of production variables, X's for the regular time and Y's for the overtime labor. Also, to compute the total inventory cost, we need to multiply the ending inventory level for each month by the holding cost, so it makes sense to introduce the variables representing the inventory level. Yes, we call these the inventory variables. So, I0 denotes the initial inventory, and it is treated as a fixed parameter rather than a decision variable, right? This is correct. And because it is given, we can easily find the inventory after the first month by adding I0 to the total number of trampolines produced during the first period, which is X1 plus Y1, and subtracting the number of units sold, which is D1. And we can use this logic to express IT using the previous month's inventory X T Y T and D T. I guess we could use this expression to completely get rid of the IT variables. Yes, we could, but let's keep them, they are convenient to use in the model. Agreed. Once the decision variables are properly defined formulating this model is a breeze. Especially for someone who feels like Superman. Ha ha. You don't need to be Superman to handle this one. Note how we handled the piecewise linear convex objective function in this example. Indeed, we used the same method, which is introducing a different variable for each slope value. That's right, 
one for 120 and one for 150. The slope is increasing, so this is a convex case. And the minimization objective ensures that yt is zero unless xt reaches its maximum of 100. Perfect. Ready to implement the model in Ample? Let's go for it. Done. That was fast maximum. You are getting more and more efficient with Ample. Yes, Optima. That's because I do the homework? Good point. Doing the homework is a key to success. Anything new you learned while implementing this one? Yes, I learned how to do set subtraction. I needed it to write the inventory constraints. I see. Since I0 is a parameter rather than a variable, you state the first inventory constraint separately from the rest. Precisely. Okay, let's run it. Fingers crossed. Yay, it works. Great. I never doubted it would. Isn't your dad going to be happy? Yes, he is, but I will make him pay for it, lol. Phew. Now we can relax. I like the work hard play hard approach. Yes, we can, but the students in the class need to remember to take the lecture quiz. I'm sure they will enjoy it. No doubts. Yeah,